Adam Delard des Ormeaux and his men had been under siege in the old Algonquin fort for five days. He and about fifteen fellow Frenchmen had come up the Ottawa River from Montreal hoping to catch the Iroquois by surprise. After teaming up with about forty-five allied Huron and Algonquin Indians, they had caught the attention of two hundred Iroquois paddling down river in their canoes after the season's hunting and who were perhaps headed to burn the crops at Montreal before harvest. Since then, the Iroquois had attacked each day with arrows, bullets, and fire, only to be repelled with heavy losses. But lately the forty Hurons had been lured out by false offers of mercy, only to be promptly executed, and the Iroquois had been reinforced by five hundred newcomers. Perhaps the battle would buy Montreal time, but Delard knew that he and his few remaining men must meet their end here at the Long Soat. When the Iroquois assaulted on the fifth day, they had constructed log defenses to parry the French musket balls, and succeeded in hacking a hole in the palisade. Delard, in a last effort, lit the fuse of a gunpowder keg and attempted to hurl it over the wall. Tragically, it struck the top of the wall, bouncing back on the Frenchman in a fiery explosion. Only one Frenchman was not immediately cut apart or burned alive in the fort, and he was summarily tortured to death. When a few straggling Huron survivors made it back to Montreal to tell the tale, the townspeople were shocked by the horrific ordeal, as well as by how lucky they had been. The large stand had cost the Iroquois dearly, and averted a catastrophic attack for the rest of 1660 but it would hardly be the end of hostilities that had been ravaging the wilderness of northeastern North America for decades, and which would continue for decades to come. You are listening to The Ingle Nook, a show about some of history's greatest stories. As always, I'm your host, Logan East. Today we venture to the thick woods along the St. Lawrence River and Great Lakes, in a time when empires and tribes clashed for control of territory resources, and the future of a continent. While most of us have heard of the French and Indian War between the French, British, and their Indian allies in the middle 1700s, far fewer have heard of the conflict that spanned nearly a century and the threatened extinction for French colonists, many indigenous tribes, and one water-loving mammal, the Beaver Wars. Before we set out, remember to like, favorite, comment, or subscribe if you enjoy the show. It's a huge help. You can catch The Ingle Nook on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast platform. But now, off we go to the pre-Columbian wilds of North America. Our story takes place in what is today eastern Canada and the midwestern and northeastern United States. American Indians, however, and early European colonists did not think of the land in terms of national, state, or political borders. They were confronted by an imposing landscape that dictated their movements and livelihoods. Almost the entire region was covered in dense forests populated by deciduous and evergreen trees. The terrain was divided by the northern reaches of the Appalachian Mountains, the Blue Ridge, Catskills, Adirondacks, Green and White Mountains. North and west of these, water ran to the Ohio River, Great Lakes, and the St. Lawrence River. South and to the east, water ran toward the Atlantic down rivers like the Hudson. Until the advent of new methods of transportation in the 1800s, these waterways represented the easiest routes for moving people and goods. Before the arrival of Europeans, these lands were occupied by many native peoples. What to call them is always a matter of debate. Before European contact, America's native peoples did not really think of each other as one united people with a shared identity. Instead, they saw each other as parts of different tribal, lingual, and cultural groupings. Following Columbus, Indian became the common word to describe indigenous peoples and while originally a misnomer, is common today among the descendants of indigenous peoples when speaking English. 
As such, I will use it for convenience. The Indians of northeastern America were divided into two broad cultural groups based on language, Iroquoians and Algonquins. Both terms, while having vague origins in Indian languages, were ultimately employed by the French to describe the people they encountered. Each tribal grouping had its own names for itself and competing tribes and would not have used these broad terms, except for one tribe literally called the Algonquins. Nevertheless, Algonquin peoples generally inhabited much of what is now Canada, occupying most of the Great Lakes region and the land north of the St. Lawrence River. They also stretched down the Atlantic coast, through New England to the Carolinas. Algonquin speakers were divided into numerous tribes. They usually lived in small huts, sometimes known as wigwams, and, while practicing corn-based agriculture, could be nomadic when necessary. The Pequots, whom the Pilgrims encountered, and the Powhatans of Asina Komoko, as well as Pocahontas, with whom John Smith dealt, were all Algonquin speakers. Iroquoians occupied the lands between the two large Algonquin regions, basically dominating upstate New York and the lands surrounding Lakes Ontario and Erie. Linguistically isolated tribes stretched as far south as Georgia, the most famous of which were the Cherokee. Again, Iroquois speakers did not consider themselves a united entity. The Wandat people, for instance, were Iroquois speakers who occupied the land north and west of Lake Ontario. The French called them the Huron, a name I will use for convenience and historical flavor. And they were enemies of the larger grouping of Iroquois that lived in modern-day New York. These latter Iroquois speakers were whom the French actually called Iroquois. These people were grouped into a confederacy of five tribes and called themselves the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. The five member tribes of the original confederacy were the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. They constructed large longhouses as semi-permanent structures that were clad with tree bark. Like many other Indian groups, the Iroquois practiced three sisters' agriculture, where corn, beans, and squash were planted together in a way that benefited each plant. The corn acted as a bean pole. The beans returned nitrogen to the soil, and the squash foliage kept moisture in the ground. The real advantage that the Iroquois had over their neighbors, however, came from their alliance. The Iroquois were united under a great league of peace sometime before sustained European contact. A supreme council, composed of fifty sachems, a word meaning chief, from the clans of the five nations would meet to make key decisions and the five individual nations would resist the urge to raid or fight each other. This ability to act in unison made them a terror to their Algonquin and Huron neighbors, even as the Iroquois population diminished over time. While there is little to no written history from the pre-European period, the various Indian nations and tribes competed regularly for hunting grounds and territory, often moving from place to place over long periods of time but rarely acting to entirely wipe out another tribe. More commonly, defeated peoples, at least women and children, would often be integrated into the victorious tribe to make up for wartime population loss. The uneasy indigenous equilibrium would be upset, however, with the arrival of Europeans. In the years following Columbus's discovery of the Americas for Europe in 1492, Waves of explorers began scouring the coastline, while Central and South America soon became the center of a vast Spanish empire, North America received far less immediate attention. Why bother wrestling wealth from a land of forest and swamps when Spanish gold mines and tobacco plantations made life around the equator seem so easy? Though explorers like John Cabot or Jacques Cartier had did indicate some viable possibilities, for most of the 1500s, the main contact Indians of eastern North America had with Europeans were with the small fleets of fishermen who came seasonally to harvest the Grand Banks fisheries. These fishermen quickly discovered that the natives had something even more valuable than fish, pelts. This development was auspicious, 
While the Indians seemed to have a never-ending supply of many kinds of pelts, the most plentiful was the beaver, and beavers were big business back in Europe. Furs of all kinds had been growing in value across Europe since the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance. Beaver was king among these furs because it could be processed into a fine felt that made stylish, comfortable, and water-resistant hats that became extremely fashionable as a status symbol among the well-to-do and, later, even the middle classes. In more recent times, this felt was used to make familiar items, such as the top hat and cowboy stetson. The trouble in Europe was that the demand for furs had essentially eradicated the European beaver, forcing traders to go as far as Muscovy for their supply, though this source, too, was becoming dear. In the meantime, West European fishermen were happy to convert pots, knives, and hooks into hundreds of valuable furs, but soon others would take note of the possibilities. At the same time, these fishermen and early explorers unintentionally introduced foreign diseases among the Indians that, over the century, would ravage the native population, softening any potential defense against a European incursion. Two men who were key in establishing a major fur trade between North America and Europe were Henry Hudson and Samuel de Champlain. In 1609, Hudson, an Englishman sailing in the service of a Dutch trading company, was on a mission to find a potential northwest passage to Asia and to locate valuable riches of gold or silver like the Spanish had found in Mexico and Peru. Hudson was hardly the only prospector in the North Atlantic. Several colonies had been tried along the southeastern coast of North America by the French and English, with the most recent being the Virginia colony at Jamestown. The Dutch, French, and English were all essentially scrounging for opportunities outside of the powerful Spanish orbit, and were struggling. Still, if any man could do it, Hudson could. He had already braved the polar waters north of Scandinavia and Russia in search of riches, and was eager to do so again in the West. Despite his optimism, however, the 1609 voyage was a scratch as far as passages and gold were concerned. Nevertheless, he did locate an excellent, large river penetrating northward into the continent. Its waters were brimming with fish, and it was easily navigable, and, barring one fatal encounter, most of the natives showed a willingness to meet them on the banks to trade. And trade they did. When Hudson finally returned to Europe, leaving behind the river that bears his name today, his Dutch sponsors would see opportunity in his findings. Hudson, unfortunately, would not be able to enjoy them, as he was sent off by his native English in search of the Northwest Passage the next year. That final and most famous of Hudson's voyages would end in mutiny and Hudson's disappearance in his namesake bay. Shedding no tears over English failure, the Dutch established the colony of New Netherland in the area surrounding the Hudson River in 1614. The entire economic basis of the colony would be the Indian beaver trade, as evidenced by the company's official seal and the seal of the city of Albany, which still bears an industrious beaver. The Dutch would receive Indian pelts at Fort Orange, their trading post up the Hudson near present-day Albany, New York. The furs would be sent down river for export to the colony's capital, New Amsterdam, situated on the island of Manhattan. Peter Minuet, one of the colony's early governors, is famously reputed to have bought the island for $24 worth of beads. While it is from the Dutch that we get the word dollar from dolder, the beads were not what we commonly think of as beads. These beads were a very special substance, wampum. Wampum was a kind of purple and white beads made from seashells that the Indians prized as Europeans did gold and silver a kind of pioneer Bitcoin, if you will. Europeans could make it using their metal tools and trade it, along with other tools and weapons, for prized beaver pelts, which were of no special rarity to the Indians. Metal tools, arrowheads, fish hooks, and even guns began to replace traditional techniques among the locals. Fur trapping became more profitable than traditional hunting and farming, and tribes that could control the beaver trade would gain competitive advantages over their neighbors. It was a win-win. In 
or so it seemed in the short term. Meanwhile, at the same time that Hudson was looking for a non-existent passage, the Frenchman, Samuel de Champlain, was voyaging up and down the St. Lawrence River in what is today eastern Canada, but was then what he called Nouvelle France, New France. Champlain was a French soldier and navigator who, after serving his country well in Europe and becoming independently wealthy, took a chance to accompany fur trading voyages to eastern Canada, after the fashion of the seasonal fishermen. After observing local Indian relationships and studying the records of Jacques Cartier and making several other voyages to the region, Champlain set about establishing a permanent French fur trading operation. With royal authority, he established the settlement of Quebec, where the St. Lawrence River narrowed. The site had been the location of Cartier's failed settlement in 1541 at an abandoned Iroquois village that the local Indians called Kanata, leading to the region also being called Canada. At Quebec, Champlain began formalizing trading relationships with local Indian tribes into fur-based alliances. Thus, the Innu people, the Algonquins, and the Hurons all became French allies with the understanding that they would bring beaver pelts to Quebec and the French would provide them with useful goods. Champlain quickly discovered, however, that his new friends lived in fear of the powerful Mohawk, one of the five Iroquois nations, to the south. Champlain, hoping to cement French Algonquin hegemony over the fur trade, set off with nine Frenchmen and a few hundred Algonquin allies up the Iroquois River, now called the Richelieu. At its head, he was the first European to see the large lake now named Lake Champlain, or Champlain in America. When the expected battle failed to materialize, most of Champlain's forces headed back toward Quebec, leaving him with only two Frenchmen and about 60 Algonquin allies. At that moment, the Mohawk band appeared, numbering about 250 strong. Fortunately for Champlain, he still had a decisive advantage at this early date, gunpowder. As he reported it, one of the Algonquins identified the three chiefs of the Iroquois who were wearing arrow-resistant armor made of sticks. Champlain apparently slew two of them at a distance using one blast from his arquebus, a primitive musket. When his fellow Frenchman picked off the other one, the Mohawk reportedly fled in a panic, giving the French Algonquin alliance momentum. Champlain continued his campaign the next year, surrounding an Iroquois fort with the help of his Indian coalition at the mouth of the Richelieu River. When the fort was breached, the French and their allies ruthlessly killed nearly all of the roughly 100 Iroquois inside. These attacks marked the beginnings of a century-long on-and-off conflict known as the Beaver Wars. Because of the importance of the beaver trade to the existence of early European colonies and to the Indian nations that participated in it, the Beaver Wars became wars not only for profit, but for existence. Defeat could spell displacement at best and extermination at worst. For the Eastern Beaver, it would ultimately mean both. While the French, Huron, and Algonquins initially held the field under Champlain's leadership and with a firearms advantage, their early dominance would only last through the early 1630s. The Iroquois would not forget their early defeats, and they would begin consolidating their power in the south, monopolizing the Dutch fur trade and reinforcing themselves with Dutch-provided firearms. Though we seldom imagine Indians relying on guns, Indians rapidly came to rely on European technologies to gain advantage over their neighbors. Guns became essential to Indians in the eastern woodlands, just as horses became emblematic on the Great Plains. This Iroquois advantage had resulted in the destruction of the Algonquin-speaking Mohicans in the 1620s. By the 1640s, a new generation was in charge a generation that had come to know only a life defined by the ups and downs of the fur trade and for the need to expand and control hunting grounds to maintain access to necessary European goods. The consequences would be violent and devastating for nearly all parties involved, though extremely profitable for those who positioned themselves wisely. By the late 1640s, the beaver supply in the core of Iroquois territory was dwindling, 
and it was time for the five nations to go on the warpath. First, they conquered the relatively small Windrow tribe directly to the east, and set their sights on the rich hunting grounds north of Lake Ontario. This put them directly into conflict with the powerful Hurons, who were the closest partners of the French. Out of loyalty to their existing coalition, the French largely refused cooperation with the Iroquois newcomers, whose main desire was not European extinction, but monopoly of their fur trade. Thus, the Iroquois would raid the French periodically and blockade Algonquin or Huron fur shipments, redirecting their fur traffic to their Dutch connections, and starving their competitors of resources. The Five Nations were actually outnumbered by other Iroquois and Algonquin tribes, but the Dutch knew a good bet when they saw one, and began a policy of directly supplying the Iroquois with firearms, as opposed to just using them as a trading item. This advancement gave the Iroquois a massive arms advantage over their neighbors. In 1648, they launched a surprise attack on the Huron at the outset of winter, shattering the nation and scattering its people. This coup had given the Iroquois a dominant position in the fur trade, and they used their momentum to begin a policy of all-out expansion to the west and south. Using their firearms advantage, and often paddling their canoes at night to achieve surprise attacks, the Iroquois were a terror both to Algonquin speakers and beavers from the Alleghenies to the Mississippi. Over the next few decades, they would go on a rampage, destroying or integrating tribe after tribe until their territory spanned the entire Ohio River Valley and most of the southern Great Lakes region. By 1680, they even controlled most of modern-day Illinois. The Iroquois onslaught, impressive as it was, was complicated by a few factors. First, their original Dutch trading partners were ousted from the Hudson Valley by English conquest in the 1660s, turning New Netherland into New York. While the English were generally happy to continue trading, they also wanted land. The Dutch had never succeeded in attracting very many settlers to the region, an ideal situation for the Iroquois. But the English had settlers to spare, which meant that the Iroquois would be forced into a difficult balancing game. Simultaneously, Iroquois expansionism earned the resentment of just about every other tribal group in the region, along with the French. The sustained Iroquois raiding against the French, as we saw in the Battle of the Long Sot, hardened French resolve to combat Iroquois power. After the Long Sot, and after a series of devastating raids in the early 1660s, the French had had enough. They set about reviving Champlain's old Huron-Algonquin coalition, sent a regiment of professional European soldiers to New France, and adopted the Dutch policy of direct arms sales to Indian allies, just as the gun-slinging Dutch were fading from the scene. When the French marched into the heart of Iroquois territory, the Iroquois fled ahead of them, refusing battle. This was probably wise given the French military advantage. Thus, the French opted to burn their crops, a devastating decision that some of their allies refused to participate in, though it was also how the Iroquois had beat the Huron years before. Brutal as the tactic was, it resulted in a temporary peace around Lake Ontario. Unfortunately for Indians to the west, this is what gave the Iroquois breathing room to expand toward Illinois. It also permitted the French to expand their fur connections throughout the Great Lakes system. Just as the Iroquois were reaching the extent of their hunting ground expansion, the French were making connections with displaced tribes in the southern reaches of the Great Lakes and around the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, such as the Miami. With them, the French brought firearms and the possibility of organized resistance to the Iroquois. By the 1680s, the stage was reset for a confrontation between the French Algonquin and Anglo-Iroquois fur empires. Hostilities began with an expansion of French fur trading forts from the Great Lakes to the Ohio River and periodic clashes between tribal bands. But, in 1687, the new governor of New France, the Marquis de Dinonville, decided to go all out. After luring the 50 leading sachems of the Iroquois to an apparent peace conference, Dinonville imprisoned them and sent them to Europe to be pressed into slavery. Rather than demoralizing them, 
This move enraged the Iroquois and resulted in the Mohawk destroying the French town of Lachine, near Montreal, and killing about 250 colonists. The ham-fisted Dinonville was quickly replaced with the far more competent Comte de Frontenac. Frontenac had led New France well for a relatively peaceful decade, from 1672 to 1682, and now he would lead it again for the rest of his life during a time of existential conflict. His focus was on maintaining strong, culturally aware bonds with his native allies while also leaving the door open to future Iroquois cooperation. In keeping with his policy, he returned the few surviving sachems from slavery back to the Iroquois. Frontenac's tenure coincided with the outbreak of King William's War from 1688 to 1697, which itself was just the North American theater of the European War of the Great Coalition, where the secondary powers of Europe fought the France of Louis XIV. Under Frontenac's leadership, the French Algonquin Coalition launched ruthless attacks on English and Iroquois settlements, carting off many civilians as slaves, much as the Iroquois had done in the past. However powerful the English would be during the next century, the Iroquois and English alliance failed in nearly every counter-raid it made against the French and Algonquins. When the European portion of the war ended in 1697, the Iroquois were left to fight on their own, which the French took as an opportunity to reach a comprehensive peace settlement. In light of ongoing English expansion to their south and a united Franco-Indian front to their north and west, the Iroquois were ready to bargain. The French called a massive peace conference in Montreal in 1701, which was attended by over a thousand representatives from nearly 40 Indian nations. The Iroquois would surrender control of most of their lands north of the Ohio River, permitting numerous Algonquin tribes to re-inhabit their traditional homelands. The peace would permit French dominance in the fur trade, while opening opportunities for all of the native tribes to trade peacefully. The peace would not be permanent, but it would last for decades. In the short term, the North American fur trade was now in French hands. With the decline of eastern beaver populations and the loss of their western hunting grounds, the Iroquois were greatly reduced in power and caught between a French rock and an expanding English hard place. Though the fur trade would continue its westward march, it left an utterly transformed land in its wake. While the tale of the great western fur trade of voyageurs and mountain men is a story for another day, we are at least left with a lesson from the eastern trade. He who lives by the beaver, dies by the beaver. Thanks for joining us around the Angle Nook. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future stories. Until next time, have a good one.